Thompson Neighborhood Association, and I welcome you all for this a historic moment for the West Side because I don't ever think we've had this much representation for the West Side in one of my so kudos to people that get this. <laughs> so, real quick, I just want to read off which neighborhood associations are here today. We have Los Jardines, we have the Thompson Neighborhood Association, we have the historic West Side, we have West. Westwood Square. Stand. We've got community workers. Do they stand? Can you look at the reps stand, please? Yeah, if you have to stand, the reps for those, if you have to stand, that'd be really good. Yeah. Let me continue. We've got community workers. We've got Loma Vista. We've got Loma Park. We've got Memorial. Heights. Memorial Heights, sorry. And Palm Garden. And we've got the 90 on Highway 90 Alliance. All of the Highway 90 Alliance. So those are, that's my phone roll. We have tier one. Tier one group? Uh, absolutely. We've also got the tier one group here with us. Westside Preservation Alliance. Westside Preservation Alliance, okay. Sign in. What's that going to uh, moving on, I have, let me do my introduction of officials here. We have the Honorable Mayor Ron Nurnberg. <laughs> Council of the Town Gonzales with Mr. Fire. Council of Roberto Trevino and New York. Uh, Senator Menendez was not able to make it today, but we do have his representatives here. with Justin Rodriguez and give him a big round of applause. <laughs> we got State Representative Pina Mijadas. <laughs> and we got the staff members for Congressman Joaquin Castro and Representative Diego Bernal. <laughs> I also like to mention that we have the superintendent, new superintendent for the Edwards School District. Explain something here. We're going to stick to agenda. We have an agenda we need to stick to. Um, the first half of this, it's going to, we're going to have three speakers. One of them is me, the other is Velma, uh, Benya, and the other person is Eugenio Rodriguez. And the topic for tonight is the essay tomorrow um, land usage plan. Um, so let's try to stay on topic. If you have any questions, there'll be a session for that in the um, Agenda, uh, that would be number five, the time for question and answers. And we're asking you to keep your questions to three minutes or your answers to three minutes um, because of the time that we have to do this. So, um, we move on to the agenda. Give me just a second. So, the first part of the agenda, and I am the first person to speak tonight. Um, as the president of the Thompson Neighborhood Association, um, I've been hearing stories about the SA Tomorrow playing groups that they've had north of us on Jarmic Road for the Westwood Neighborhood Association. Um, hasn't affected us yet because we haven't been, we, we're not going to be hit until September with getting our committees together. But some of the things I've been hearing from the other neighborhood associations have um, concerned me. Um, and the one thing that I can't say is our neighborhood, the Thompson Neighborhood Association, has plans that were made years and years ago. So looking at those plans and knowing the folks who made those plans, the history of those plans, and the people who took time to create those plans years ago, I would ask that when we do get to that point, when we start doing the um, essay tomorrow for my neighborhood, 
that we kind of respect those plans and make sure that we don't just completely do away with them. Okay, Velma? Sure. I have a lot to share. Stand on the side. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got this one. Yeah. I'll just have a lot of those. Thank you. Yeah, I know y'all are welcome. Thank you again for coming. I, this is very important for us to be able to tell you our concerns uh, concerning the concerning the SA Tomorrow plan. So I, I just wrote something that I would like to share with you. In the best interest of our community, neighborhoods, community and neighborhoods, we are advocating for this particular cause, allowing us, the constituents, neighborhood leaders, to voice and address our concerns regarding the near west side community plan. There are five regional center plans, one near the west side community plan, and that would be us. We're the first. And this is not what the West Side Coalition considers a neighborhood plan. After attending meetings for one year with SA Tomorrow, we are left with more questions and answers. We, the West Side leaders, want to be given an opportunity to be part of the process that can help us create a better neighborhood plan and have it included in the community plan and its land uses as well to be honored. But in the long run, our community will be poorly impacted, being the guinea pigs in a bad experiment. And for the last, for the, and for the last 300 years, West Side and communities have been disrespected and ignored, and this feels like more of the same. And I will close with this: We are supposed to leave our children and grandchildren better off than we are. Than we are. We want to help decide their future, and we want the next 300 years to be the better, to be better than the last. Please give us the neighborhoods that we deserve, and that's all we want to do. Okay, thank you, Bill. The next person coming up is Eugenia Rodriguez. I'm from the Loma Vista Neighborhood Association and I'm a troubleshooting for Laura Wolver, the website. <laughs> okay. You remember Mr. Rodriguez? Well, it's even I believe. Um, the reason I'm here is because I was involved with the San Antonio SA Tomorrow when it first began, back when Hartberger and uh, uh, began this thing. It was wonderful for each group because it was separated into different sections. You had parks, you had this, you had streets, you had that. But what people don't realize even before that, if you had been involved in city uh, city issues, you would realize that all these things are interconnected. Everything is interconnected. So, so when that happened, what I noticed the plan was being used. Like let's say people love parks, people love this, but they say they want to do some huge housing project. Just as an example, well they'll say, well, the parks like it. They like it, so the whole plan likes it. No, each section likes their own things. Okay. Today we're something called the land use plan. What is a land use plan? Some of us know, some of us don't. The only reason I know a little bit better is because I was on the zoning commission. What you have, most of you are probably aware of zoning. You have residential zone, and you have our art, what is it, R4, R5, R6, depending on the size of the lots. And then it goes to uh, Office 1, Office 2. Even that right there means Office 1 means that uh, you can go and see clients. Office 2, clients can come and see you. Then you have um, <coughs> uh, business. What's the one? Yeah. That's the old one. Uh, commercial. Commercial. Uh, C1, C2, <laughs> C3. The higher the number, the, the greater the impact on the community. So, and then you have multi, uh, before that you have multifamily now. So, they have all the residential multifamilies, and uh, multifamilies can be uh, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes. So, when you come across that, I mean, they know all this stuff. What is it? Uh, kind of try to bring them up to part. <clears throat> when you hear, like, let's say, quadplexes, and they say we're going to have four units, well, 
and you look into the details, what comes up sometimes, not complexes, but let's say, uh, uh, with multifamily. Oh, who do you think? Duplex. Okay? So they're going to have four duplexes. No. If they say they're going to have four units, um, it means it can be eight duplexes. I mean, eight, eight units. I mean, uh, my brain is fried. I broke from the medical center. Here. Okay. So let's say they're going to have four units per acre. What is a unit? You think of some four houses, four cars, or whatever. But you got to be careful because if it's four duplexes, it's actually eight units. If it's four quadplexes, it's actually four times four, 16, 16 units. So it might sound like it's not too intrusive, but it is. Right now, they're also going into the process of, I don't know if they already modified the multifamily use. They might have, I'm not sure. The city center. So anyhow, so here comes the land use plan. Right now, things are zoned at least commercial, and um, respectively. But the land use plan is hovering above all this. Okay? So what they do, or the proper way that was done in the old days, they were called neighborhood community plans. A neighborhood community plan sometimes took two to three years to create. And then back then, and he was very, was he? Okay, he was very blessed in that he actually had a nationally recognized planner directing, directing that issue, that neighborhood community plan. A neighborhood community plan is very precise. You have the whole community knows how the community works. They know where the problems are. They know where PD is needed. They know where the traffic is at. They know all these things. And guess what? Back then, they were given studies of traffic impact studies. They were given studies of uh, the income levels of the community so that when you build things, it doesn't kick them out of your area. Um, they were given more precise information to use so that they could create their neighborhood deal. Avenida Guadalupe is the only one in our area that has a community plan on this side of Highway 90. That's the only one. This section that we are planning is 7,700 acres. Okay? So we're dictating, we really don't know what the heck's going on. It's too big. To me, it's too big. We have to go and do it the right way. With neighborhood community plans in which you have the directly impacted community involved. This is a great idea, but it seems more like it's for somebody else, not for us. I mean, that's the way it looks. I mean, I know that's not what, what it means. Now, some people say it's not zoning. Well, having been in zoning, depending on who the, who the attorney is representing the developer, uh, it's like a done deal. Because let's say we want to build commercial here, and there's houses, and since it's a commercial street, well, when they do that land use plan, they pretty, go, pretty much go with the land use plan. You have to have very good speakers or some issue that's there in order to go against the land use plan. It's a key to open the door. So, what's sad is, what is zoning? Zoning is sometimes the first place regular citizens ever go before their city. The first time. And you should see them there because I don't know if they're going to speak kind of assustados and they're spoken in public. They're trying to protect their property if somebody's going to do something they're in agreement with. So you can say, well, let's say a bar, an extreme. You're going to build a bar next, next to my house. Why not? So, um, so people panic. So they go to zoning. That's the first time you ever, people usually, it's really close to their city. But what happens if you have a land use plan? Let's say the land use plan allows for a bar. But those four people go and speak before us. And we in good faith or the zoning commissioners listen to those or the planning commission. The planning commission will say, yep, it fits the plan. Then they give a recommendation of approval, goes to the zoning. Zoning's already well, the planning commission says it's okay. Uh, it depends how many people show up, who speaks, who has more, uh, who has a, a better ear, who's a better speaker, really. So, and we have more evidence. So, como quiera. So the community that's there doesn't have a voice. And that's my concern. When you have a land use plan, it's like we're taking away the voice of the impact of coming in. Because somebody else, which is going to be us, because we're all in it. And I did request, and I even wrote a letter to Chris. I said, Chris, if this moves forward the way it is, please tell him that Nino Rodriguez from Loma Vista neighborhood, I gave him my license number and everything. I don't But uh, it's not an agreement. We have to keep it open. Now, another serious thing, why he's concerned, is because he does have a community plan. Avenida Guadalupe has a community plan. 
But the land use plan is already going over. Guess what? That trumps the community plan that took two to three years to make. And that's, that's not fair to those from that area. I mean, it's the people thing. But um, since you all only dedicated to this type of meeting, no, they're dedicated to CPS, you name it, all of Don Catwell, Villa Freya. So there's so many things going on uh, that in truth, it's hard to, you know, there's so many things. But the devil's in the And I'm trying to bring that forth to you guys. The experts in the communities are all the people that live in that area. The experts, we have experts in the city. Why not bring those experts together and we come back with the community plans? Like kids, if you look at this, it's awesome. It doesn't really intrude in that community. It's great. The Avenida Guadalupe is up to par. The ones in, uh, where is the tier one? Anybody from tier one? They have community plans and they serve their community in an exceptional way. So let's get the experts that are here throughout the city, and let's use the expertise of, our, of the city. Because we got, I mean, you know, we got this in the world. I mean, we got, we got great, I mean, great stats. But if we rush it, we're going to fail. And we don't want to do that. I mean, let's represent the community. That's all we're asking for. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to the agenda is time for question and answer, so this is time for you all to answer some of the things that you all are hearing tonight. So who wants to go first? Uh, I'll go. Um, so, um, um, although I probably shouldn't go for fun there. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'll let you go first for fun. Feel free, sir. There's a dance. They have to do it. I hear from you very often. They don't have to hear from me. Well, first of all, I just, I'll, I'll say thank you uh, to all the neighborhoods who have gathered tonight uh, to be part of this meeting. Um, our role here, I think, most importantly, is to listen to your concerns and make sure that they're acted upon uh, as we go into our, our council meetings and we go into the committee meetings. Um, I will say, just stepping back for a minute on the whole essay tomorrow process, the intent here is that amidst all of this incredible growth that we're having, and, and we all feel differently about that growth because it's impacting us differently depending on where you are in the city, uh, amidst all of this growth that's occurring, that you uh, and your families who are already here in San Antonio can enjoy uh, your community and not be adversely impacted by that growth. Um, SA Tomorrow began with that uh, recognition, Eugenio, about the fact that we can't just do land use in a box, in an isolation, but everything is connected to everything else, whether it's water use or, or land use or energy or the way we plan our parks and so forth. Everything is connected, and if we're going to have a quality community, we have to plan it comprehensively. Um, I'm hearing a few things tonight. One is that uh, you uh, in the neighborhoods, all of us together, we all live in, in homes and neighborhoods in some respect, want to have a voice in the process. Um, Essay Tomorrow, when it began, was not so much about a plan that was being put together and being placed into a document. It was about a process that was intended to bring people together to plan our community. It was supposed to be, and it is supposed to be, and I would argue that it is uh, a table that we sit at to plan what our community will look like in the future. Um, the second thing I'm, I'm hearing is that there are a number of, of us who have worked very hard over the last several decades, two and three and four and five years at a time, to create neighborhood plans. And you are concerned that those neighborhood plans are going to get trumped, subsumed, uh, run roughshod over by these land use plans. Um, I'm here to tell you that that is not the intent. And if that is occurring at the community level, whether it's in a zoning meeting or a neighborhood association meeting, then that is not uh, being implemented the way we intended. Um, the land use plans that you're talking about, which are 7,000 plus acres large, are intended to use the neighborhood plans as a building block so that we have a more coordinated land use strategy, a more coordinated land use plan so that as 
more development comes in that are going to be close to your neighborhood, Cynthia, or that more uh, commercial activities coming in that are going to be abutting right next to your house and your green belt that you expect it to have for the rest of your life, that we're limiting the adverse impacts, that we're having uh, land use patterns that are not only respectful of the neighborhood plans that have been built years ago, but that are also coordinating with the adjacent land around it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of details involved um, with establishing those land use plans, and we can't do it at this level, uh, you know, in one meeting. But there is a lot of work ahead, and you need to be part of it. And so that's what this meeting for me is going to be about, is making sure that we understand the initial concerns going into the implementation of the West Side Plan, uh, but that when it's done, you don't feel like a guinea pig, but you feel like you've got it done first before all of this uh, growth really starts to impact the community. And I'm so happy uh, that we are taking the implementation seriously uh, because it is what you are going to experience your city like uh, over the next however many generations. Uh, and we are focused on this as a, as a city council together. Uh, Shirley Gonzalez, who is our District 5 City Councilwoman, is the chair of the Comprehensive Planning Committee, who is a first stop um, to all of these concerns. Nothing is actually approved, not even at the Zoning Commission, not even at the Planning Commission, not even at Shirley's committee, until they see it all and they say it's ready to go and the council acts on it. So there's a lot of stop gaps in place to make sure that we don't get this wrong and that you have a voice in the process. So I'll hand it now to you, Shirley. So thank you, Mayor, and yeah, you know, that's why I sort of jumped to speak first because I chair the committee. Um, but actually, it's of course in the mayor's direction that I that I chair that committee. Councilman Benavino also um, sits on that committee with me. And when the mayor asked me to chair this committee about a year ago, of course I got briefed on it, and then I got briefed again. And then I repeatedly kept asking for more briefings because it's very complicated. So I don't think that um, that you know us as neighborhood associations should feel any uh, problem with repeatedly asking for more meetings, more delays, more community action. Because even I get chair of the committee and get sometimes as many as two briefings before it goes to my committee. I uh, often have questions, and I ask the staff, "Show me your presentation," because if I don't understand it. My colleagues are not going to understand it, and certainly the community is not going to understand it. So I'm very grateful for, uh, for you all for organizing us today so we could talk a little bit about this. Because the other thing that we all know, and, and I think I, I may, um, the two state representatives I think are not involved with the Let's Say Tomorrow process, but of course are very concerned with the activity that happens in their neighborhood. So if they can't answer the questions, they haven't been digging really deep into the Essay Tomorrow plan. Uh, but we, um, as you know, as our, uh, our have been discussing in our comprehensive planning committee meetings, uh, and over the years, in fact, before I chaired, when uh, Mayor Taylor was the mayor and she was also working on this plan, it's been a couple of years now in the making. Um, but what we all know as elected officials is that really what matters the most is not the committees we chair and not the work that we do um, at the committee level or what, what people really want to know is how is this going to impact me? How is this decision going to impact me? And that matters at every level, uh, whether you're the council representative or the state representative, certainly the mayor, and every step along the way. And so I think this is why it's so important that we are discussing some of these issues. And I really feel like um, we, need to, we need to have city staff to answer more technical questions about the plan. But I think I, I just want to reiterate what the mayor said about needing our community input. So one thing that the SA Tomorrow Plan is not zoning, um, and uh, that's really important to know. Zoning will always be separate and apart. This is a plan that we hope to implement, but this plan looks very different in our neighborhood because we're a neighborhood, we're not growing. And this is different from what's happening in other parts of the city where we are seeing a lot of rapid growth I hate to say rapid, but we're seeing growth. There's this projected idea that we're a hundred, uh, that a million people are coming to our neighborhoods. That's primarily outside the county, 
and it's also primarily internal growth. So I think that's really important to recognize is that they're not droves of people coming all over the country, moving into San Antonio. It's Latino families like ours having more children and staying here. And so that makes our land use different. It makes our housing different, uh, I think. And it, it makes it really important to all of us in the way that we design our city. So I, I know it was sort of, a, we didn't have, I didn't have a specific question to address. Um, and, and we can answer very specific questions. I'm very well briefed, Councilman Trevino also sits on the committee, so he's very well briefed uh, on the essay tomorrow, but um, we have been taking your input very seriously. Uh, we asked for multiple delays. Councilman Trevino has asked multiple times to delay some things because people didn't feel satisfied. Uh, we had pulled one item that was supposed to go to council actually on the dais because it was a million plus dollar consulting contract um, for uh, consultants to do a bunch of different things on the plan. And it, take a, it took a long time for us to really understand like what are those million dollars going to? It was supposed to be for marketing, a lot of it. And so we need to continue to work with our staff to make sure that people are getting informed correctly about exactly what's happening. But there, I mean, I can go on some details about the 13 regional centers and the neighborhood plans, but one of the reasons that we have a West Side plan uh, is because I noticed as we were going through this process um, that the West Side, really from downtown all the way almost to 1604, there was nothing. I mean, there was nothing for us on the plan. We don't have a regional center. We don't have a large employer. We do have one at the port. That was considered a regional center. But on the west side, there was nothing. There's no growth centers. That means there's no major employers. There was no activity. There was going to be no plan. So we added a couple of different layers to bring in some community um, neighborhood plans. And that's why we have this enormous <coughs> west side neighborhood plan that really should be broken down into probably six different plans, in, in my view. And many of you have them already. So how old is your plan, Rudy? Right. All dates all the way back to 1998. Okay, so too old. Yeah, and then there's uh, the one that was done in 2010. Oh, 2010, okay. So that, I mean, 2010 even questionable, like is that um, recent enough? Uh, some of them were quite old. We had some that were done as recently as 2012 for the Lone Star neighborhood. So we need to find a way to implement those plans, but I also think we need to think of ourselves a little differently when we are in areas that in fact are not growing. We know that in our census tracts on the west side, at least in my district, District 5, we've had a declining population since the 1950s or so. So how do we bring people back into our neighborhoods? How do we make public spaces desirable? How do we grow small businesses? How do we continue to grow jobs at the port? I think every, many of y'all look around the room and I think many of y'all know here that in Kelly's uh, heyday, there were about 25,000 employees at Kelly. Right now, there's about 12,000. So we'll never, it, it would be, not that we'll never, but it is a long time before we get back to the growth and the jobs that we had in this neighborhood uh, back before the 1980s, and even previously before then. So as we go asking specific questions about the SNR plan, um, to our plan, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. And I think I'll turn it over to my councilman, uh, my colleague, Councilman Trevino, to talk a little bit about what he's hearing from his neighborhood associations for the SA tomorrow's plan. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, and I'll just touch on you know, what you said, and, and I really uh, caught on to that is how people are intimidated with the process. And almost every city process can have its level of intimidation, and we want to make sure that we're clearing some of that out. And you know, I, I want to point something out. Uh, we also want to make sure that people know that we offer serious Spanish translation at all these meetings. And, and so if you feel that there's some lack of translation services in our city, we have somebody in charge of that, Carlos Valenzuela. Write that name down. If there is a lack of Spanish translation services and any meetings that you are, are, are at, call, call the office, call my office, we'll put you in touch with Carlos Valenzuela this is a very serious thing because, as you pointed out, can you imagine going to, to a, a meeting and you're, you're, you're being explained uh, all kinds of complex data and information about your property, but you don't necessarily fully understand English. So you know, we want to make sure that people uh, fully understand what's, what's, what's impacting them. Of course, then on top of that, now we're talking about the different land use categories and, and, and what, what all that means, and it's really complex. And, 
and it's yeah, it's not English. It's 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 something else. And 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 so we're what we're asking is for people to understand that you know this this needs to be much clearer. And we get it. So we're not going to be shy about asking for delays. We're not going to be shy about asking for more meetings, clarity. Uh, this next month, I've asked the American Institute of Architects, the AIA, located on South Florida, to host a series of meetings to, to help with maybe some of that kind of translation. You know, so instead of having the planning staff continually talking about some of the, the categories, maybe uh, the AIA can help with some of that. And my staff, Chrissy McCain, will be assisting with that as well. So, so just know we're trying everything we can to get that information out there because it is complex. And, uh, but the bottom line is, you know, we need to make it something that's relatable, that's understandable, and ultimately, as, as was, was asked of us for, for a long time already, is to make sure that the neighborhood plans are incorporated, are a part of all of this, not referenced, not a tab or an index in the overall plan, but part of it. And, and I, I believe that that is, a, that is a, uh, a, a good ask, and I think that that is the way you plan a city, that's the way uh, you get more eyes on the kind of things that you're doing to, to help improve communities and neighborhoods like ours. Uh, so just know that we know that it is a very complex issue. This Thursday, we're at my field office, we're hosting uh, District 1 uh, constituents to come out, and we're going we're gonna to do our own uh, quick little run through of the different land uses and what planning is, is, is proposing. We're also, it's also kind of in concert with some of the CCRs that we, we put out there. We're, we've got a wide area rezoning. And why do we have a wide area rezoning? Because a lot of the issues you're talking about are, are occurring because there's some translation errors. Zoning that is occurring in different neighborhoods that are impacting them in, in ways they can't seem to understand and nobody understands either, so they can't explain it, right? You can drop a, a, a very unique zoning category in the middle of the block, makes no sense, and the land use pattern actually helps to kind of to address what you're talking about. So um, please know that, that we're here with you, um, and we're that's why we're here today, to listen to some more about what we can do to facilitate more meetings, facilitate uh, more clarity about what this means to our city. We want a, 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 a beautiful city, a growing city, a city by design, and not something that is just by accident or that's, that's thoughtless. And you know, we've seen many meetings like this, and uh, just want to say thank you for organizing this, and this is something that we think uh, uh, needs to, to happen more often throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we'll now have to the uh, microphone right here for questions from the audience out here. So if you all have questions, go to the microphone. Here are the rules, though. You have three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. We are timing. We also want you to stay on task. Today's subject is the strategy for the uh, essay tomorrow. However, if you have other questions that you want to ask your representatives here today, write it on the back of your agenda, and I'll make sure that it gets your representatives, all right? Go ahead and state your name and what neighborhood association you're with. Uh, my name is Amelia Valdez, and I'm from the newly uh, registered historical site resident association. Um, with my concern this morning, where is in San Antonio? Um, I went away to college and came back, and um, it seemed like we were still in this same place, right? Um, my father was in the military, but my mother gave a lot to the community. Uh, and we seem to, when we come to these meetings with, with the essay comprehension plan, it seems so distant, right? Like, we, we can't seem to catch up with it. Uh, being so far behind in the historical sense about where we are, uh, how are we going to fix those and come into essay tomorrow? Uh, when a 7-Eleven, when there was a historic mall house, it's very emotional for me because there comes the 7-Eleven, things that are already existing there. That's a big deal. You got the mic. Gas. Let me just say this, no respect. 
It's just no respect for it. We're behind, we've been behind all our lives. My dad, we built, did everything that we wanted to do. What the city council wanted us to do, we did everything we wanted to do. They thought we had the most behind. That's why. Thank you. So thank you um, for uh, organizing yourselves for the West uh, Historic West Side. Um, and uh, last year, uh, I authored the equity budget that was based on street maintenance. I was very proud to have done that work um, with my staff. Uh, it took us about a year and a half to compile all the data for PCI score. And I don't want to get too too sidetracked with that because um, because I know that we're here to talk about land use, but what PCI score had to do with pavement condition index, and that means the quality of our streets. And we found that there were six districts, I'm sorry, there were five districts in the city that had a less than 70 PCI score, and that was districts one, two, three, five, and 10. So when we did our budget, city budget last year, we added an additional $35 million to streets that were less than 70 PCI. Uh, and this year, again, we added another $35 million to streets that were less than 70 PCI. And we included in another $11 million for streets that are within 410, some of our oldest streets. I'm very proud to have done that because it means in the last two years we've gotten an additional $70 million for our street maintenance. Um, and I think that's really, really significant for us in Districts 1 and Districts 5. But, uh, and sidewalks were included in our city budget, and which they had not previously been. So this is the first time we've been talking sidewalks as part of our IMP, which is our in, uh, um, uh, infrastructure maintenance program. But I had a meeting today with um, another uh, people in the city because we know that while we need infrastructure, we need streets, we need sidewalks, uh, drainage is still an issue that we have not been able to address. And one thing, there is no score for drainage. It's easier to do with, with streets because there's a score, sidewalks, you can do gaps, but how do you account for drainage? And so what we came up with very simply and non -very, not technical is that, and what the city staffer told me, was that the reality is our oldest districts have worse drainage because of the way our city was, was designed, regardless of income. So whether you live in King William, whether you live in Elmo Heights, whether you live you know, here on the west side, you have really bad drainage. And so we need to redirect our funds, our stormwater maintenance program, to the oldest areas. And that can be done just simply by saying, within 410, we're gonna invest all of our drainage dollars within this area to help correct, um, not necessarily historically under certain areas, but just the fact that we have an old city, 300 years old. So as we continue to address this issue of, uh, of just simple things that we know that we all deserve, we've been paying taxes all these years, the simple things that everybody say they want, public safety, street maintenance, sidewalks, drainage. That's what people want. So let's redirect the most of the majority of our budget to those things, and let's consider drainage based on the oldest parts of the city, and that would help us uh, make um, our areas a little bit more desirable and, um, and give us a better quality of life. If you allow me real quick, check out what to see in San Zamora. We've been under construction for almost a whole year on streets. Just FYI, it's up. It's it's up. We have broken. We have broken. You can hear my voice. You got broken uh, sidewalks, construction, cars that been hit, trees that fell because of construction. Check out that whole corridor. It's Potosí and San Zamora, Escobar, Park, and Casiano. We've been behind, I think it's going on a year and a half. And, and yeah, those are still getting worked on. It was a SAWS project, right. uh, and it should have been finished. No, it's not finished. Uh, that's why, in fact, the last time I was there, it was finished. Perhaps they didn't do a good job. No. I, need to I still have the tent on my car where it tracks everything. Uh, but you know, as, as we're, we are investing more of our dollars in our streets, we're going to see, of course, a lot more construction. And it's a little bit more damaging for us because our houses are so much closer to the street. So we've got to work with our city staff to make sure that we um, maintain. I just want to add something because this 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 just happened. Uh, of course, uh, hope to get it ratified in, in our budget this year. But to your point about streets and sidewalks and when is it going to get done? 
one of the one of the most important things we can do is hold people accountable. And we don't have somebody like that for sidewalks. Um, we have a PCI score, and as Councilwoman Gonzalez mentioned, but we don't do that for sidewalks. And year after year, it's the number one ask in our city. And this year, we have budgeted into uh, the this year's fiscal 2019 fiscal budget 1819 a what's called a pedestrian mobility officer. With that, uh, I hope to also get a pedestrian mobility uh, committee, which is, would be represented by di every different council district, uh, to really take a look at this. Because to your point, we need to put a timeline on projects, and we need to measure them and see how are they performing, why are they taking, why are there delays? Because uh, certainly, it's it's not just happening on Sasamora; it's happening in different parts of our city, and we need to hold a lot of the the, the folks accountable, the contractors and the contracts in the way they're, that they're done so that we can encourage and incentivize contractors to finish not just on time, but maybe ahead of time and save us money. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, no questions. Do you have a question? I'm not. Oh, okay. All right. Go ahead, man. I'm going to make a statement. <laughs> okay. Yes? Okay, go ahead and make that statement. My name is Lalo de Leon, and I've lived in this neighborhood for over 50 years, and nothing changed dramatically since I got here. I'd like to point out the statistics that a survey was conducted of different parts of town, uh, town uh, throughout the city, in the uh, Commerce Enrique Barrera Parkway Corridor was rated 0 0.05 versus the 151, uh, uh, 260, uh, which is the one going to the north side, uh, 281. 281, uh, they rated 83%. The bad news about it was that they told us that we will never be able to catch up because uh, the density of this area town. Now, I have a suggestion that there's a lot of people in this part of town that owns an acre or more. Why couldn't we give them assistance the same way we give developers? work something out with them and invest money and of course we have to comply with the uh, zoning and all that but let's say if you have one acre uh, maybe two or three duplexes or whatever it is uh, you know, the assistance that they need one of the biggest things that we have right now is the uh, West Side Training Center one of the best in America. And from that, you have four more that were instituted throughout the city. So that part of uh, um, Enrique Barreto Parkway is actually the anchor to a lot of businesses. And uh, I remember uh, when I was going to high school in uh, 1959 AD, uh, <laughs> they uh, told us that, oh, that, that Houston was uh, made all of their businesses through the uh, universities. And I couldn't see that, but now I'm seeing that uh, institutes like that bring out of the uh, things to our community. So uh, these things that I'm telling you is because this part of town does not have density and if we want to go to the movies we have to go 50 miles uh, a senior citizen center we don't have it's a chain that the, our citizens that are senior citizens uh, uh, have to uh, stay indoors someplace for a school and they cannot uh, uh, attend a university uh, uh, senior citizen center. Uh, 
I'm suggesting that we have a comprehensive signature center about $23 million. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank and somehow we've got to represent both of you in this conversation. <laughs> Over my, you know what? Giving up my anger, Lance. Nor I, nor I, Lance. Amen. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gloria Hernandez, and I'm the president of Las Palmas, a neighborhood association. And we're new, we're still forming our bylaws, but we have been meeting. And uh, the whole purpose was to try to get the Las Palmas area somehow um, uh, a little help. I, I look around and uh, now I'm older and as you get older you kind of see things from a different point of view and you have more time to give. So um, I, I kind of made it my, my, little, my little job now to try to uh, do a little something for, for our, our, our neighborhood. Just this, this is my backyard, have some kind of clean day, uh, get together, uh, have the other little micros, uh, get together for a little potluck, potluck. But what I did notice, uh, and I've lived, uh, I'm third generation here in this neighborhood. We lived uh, right next to our grandma. So um, what I noticed, uh, growing up, I grew up on the southeast side. And when I moved over here, um, there was not very many uh, entertainment close by. Where I grew up, there was a bowling alley, there was uh, the skating rink, you know, you had um, uh, the movies, you know, maybe you know, a few blocks down that your parents would pick you up, or drop you off and pick you up. And uh, that, that is a little lacking in, 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 in my neighborhood. There's a lot of eateries, you know, banks, or businesses, but that, that, we, that we support, that we support, but we need something that sort. So I'm hoping to get a plan together for our little neighborhood and, uh, and try to get that in the neighborhood. Because it is historic. Uh, a lot of the homes, as the gentleman said, uh, are older, and the taxes every year seem to weigh on us more and more. So uh, I'd appreciate you coming in and visiting us. Thank you. Um, so I wasn't joking when I said that somehow we've got to represent both of you, you know, Ray and Laura as well. But so let me tell you something, uh, or let me give you a perspective um, that I'm, I'm hearing from all the room here. That the truth of the matter is, change is happening as as we live the day in San Antonio. It is occurring, and while Ray may hold on to his acres. There are going to be people around you, Ray, who are going to sell their acres to do exactly what she's saying to do. And what we're trying to do is make sure that there's not um, endless bureaucracy in the, in the process of trying to plan for our community. That when somebody does sell their acres, that we've already agreed what would be beneficial for us when something's built there. Is it a hospital or is it a strip center? Is it a bowling alley or is it a duplex or a, an apartment complex? Those are the conversations we're trying to have today so that somehow you and Laura will be as close to satisfied as possible and so will your children. The point is though, we can't avoid that conversation because that change is happening. And that's the whole point of SA Tomorrow is helping us come to the table to agree on what that ultimate um, neighborhood should look like when the growth does occur. Of course. Um, so uh, thank you, and I think you know uh, Ron, of course, expressed it well because we know that we need more people in our neighborhoods, and I think that the school district can attest to that as well. The declining enrollment in our public schools then lead to school closures and that sort of thing. So we've got to make people want to. And, and, and my my feeling is that not necessarily that we need to bring a lot more people in our neighborhood. We just want to make sure that those of us that are here stay. So we have this young man here, and I, is this your son? Yes. Okay, you look alike. So, um, is that you know after you go to college and you get educated, uh, that you don't feel like you have to leave your neighborhood to have a good quality of life? And that's what I wanted to build. Uh, is a city that you all can stay in. Uh, because we have a lot of vacancies, there's housing available 
Um, and we could, uh, Mayor could also talk about the Housing Task Force and what that's presenting. But absolutely, we have to incentivize small-scale development. That was one of the things that came out of the pilot project that I'm working on uh, in our neighborhood. Um, in, we, there's a District 5 pilot program just for housing. And some of that is so that we make it easier for people to build on vacant lots, that we make it easier for people to sell their property and add. Uh, built accessory dwelling units. My mother lives next door to me too, and I just rehabbed that house for her. Um, it was not a good financial investment um, because it was so expensive to upgrade a new home that it doesn't make sense. Uh, and most of it had to be paid for in cash because the house was not livable. So that is not something that we should burden our young people with. We need to be able to get a traditional mortgage just like, like you would if you were buying a home in Stone Oak um, or, or any other place, right? You should be able to live where you, where you want and hopefully we build a community here in our neighborhood that you want to live in and so that's also part of the SA tomorrow plan but I, I am really proud of us here in this room so many of our presidents that organized because since I've been on the council we've had four new neighborhood associations and I cannot tell you how proud that makes me feel really care about their neighborhoods and we as council members and the representatives we want to respond to people I mean it gives us no greater pleasure than to sit here before you all today and talk about our city uh, but if we don't have anyone to represent because we don't have neighborhood associations and essentially we're I mean, we don't have anyone to work for. So uh, I am uh, very grateful for all for everybody's presence today. And and um, and in fact, you know, here in, in I know in District Five, we only have 11 na registered neighborhood associations. So Ron, how many do you have in District Eight? Eight. eight. So do you see, like, we need people. Um, we and so they had 80 people that would get together. 80 presidents. Uh, we have 11 or 12. So I think we're making a really good solid impact with the few people that we have. So thanks everybody for being here again. Hi, um, I'm Debbie. Um, I'm trying to, I do have some questions, but I also wanted to make a statement. Actually, what you just said, what I'm noticing is in our neighborhoods, west side, south side, east side, well, not so much um, certain areas, but there, there aren't any places to gather. And that keeps a lot of neighborhood associations from forming. If we want to form a neighborhood association, we have to pay every month. And we have all these community centers all over San Antonio. And if you want to rent them, you've got to pay $250. And they just sit there, empty, day after day after day. We, I have a lady in my neighborhood that will teach um, kids how to play the piano for free. Free! But guess what? If she wants to do that, she's got to go pay for one of those rooms to teach the kids to play piano for free. Are That's those facilities? Yes, they are. And I actually went to the City Parks and Recreation Center today because there's a screening of a movie that they want to offer free that would be great about our public schools. I can't find a free place to have it. Now, I'm going to ask some places, some people that were here to come here um, to see if they can have it at one of their locations. But if we should have those free places everywhere in San Antonio. You're not going to charge here, then? No. We would we'll charge. Go fix that. But it's still free. But see, that's the thing. I, I, have to, I have to call somebody with a connection to get it done in a city facility. But we should be able to do that. Free. You know, that's what I'm saying. These neighborhood associations, most of them have to pay dues because they can't find a place to have their meeting and air conditioning free. And it's only an hour. So that's something that y'all should maybe think about. If you want, if you want more community involvement, then give us places where we can gather free. Does that make any sense? Um, that was one thing I did. Yeah, one more minute. Okay. Um, now, this is the other thing that I wanted to ask, and this is something that I wrote down. And I mean, I guess it's the million dollar question. It's like, what words or actions for many of us in this room or any side can make you um, see what we're saying and then actually when you leave here, go take action? Because it, it hurts us. Like, I have my friend, Dina, she posted a picture of this horrible sidewalk. I mean, it made me cry. It really did. This right by her mom's house where it's all cracked up. And yet there's this beautiful bike trail sign there. And I'm like, what? That's your bike trail? That's not fair. You know, because I see bike trails being built and 
and and you know excavating down the sides of rivers and everything to build these beautiful bike trails on other sides of town. And my friend's got this crumbly, ugly bike trail in front of her from mom's house. That's sad. And so something like that, it's like what makes people say, well, they don't deserve to have a new bike trail until it's so ugly that nobody can walk on it anymore. And, and so those are the kinds of things I'm hoping that y'all will think about. Thank you. I'm going to respond just because I feel left out. Uh, <laughs> I'm missing my city council days. Um, but, but I think, you know, first of all, uh, Rudy and, and the group, thank you for organizing this. Um, many of you may not know, but before I was on council, I started as a neighborhood association president when I lived right by Jefferson High School um, and was part of the Near Northwest Community Plan formation back then, right? And we sat through a couple dozen meetings uh, to get that done. So the work is meaningful. And I know from your perspective that nothing is more demoralizing when you are not respected, as was mentioned, or ignored. Um, and all that does is lessen your faith in government. So uh, I hate to speak for anybody up here, but I know we're all here because we care and we want to try and make a difference for you. So. Um, let me just mention something that um, you know I think is somewhat state related, and you know Ina and I uh, fight the good fight in Austin every two years. But something that you may not know that I can't make promises, but in terms of coordination of efforts, um, just a quick story. Two sessions ago, I, I've served on appropriations now the last two sessions. Two sessions ago, uh, and, and Mayor, uh, you'll remember this. Um, there was an attempt to try and get some money from the state to help with uh, Hartberger Park, the expansion of Hartberger Park. Um, there is uh, money in the state budget for local parks. Um, and I remember that uh, Mayor Hartberger at the time came to the, uh, my office uh, with my colleague, Trey Martinez Fisher, uh, took him to the speaker's office. And um, for Trey and, our, Trey and I, the negotiating point was, sure, we'll try and get this money in the budget. But we want an equal amount for Westside Parks. Uh, Shirley, you remember you worked on this with us. So we ended up getting a um, million dollars for Woodlawn Lake and Monterey. Uh, so there are ways to. And Rosedale. And Rosedale, excuse me, that's right. So there are ways that we can be helpful. Again, it depends on the budget, and I know next session is going to be tough. But um, you know, even though it's been, I guess, seven years or so since I've been on city council, uh, we're always thinking locally, right? When, when Nina and I come back to the neighborhoods, we're always thinking about how can we help um, make quality of life better for our constituents. So just keep that, I just wanted to mention that because again, um, I, I didn't come tonight just to pay for the pizzas. We're here to listen, we're here to listen. And thank you, I, I was just came with the plug. I appreciate this. Uh, but, but we are here to listen because this is important. And, um, you know, even though we don't know much about the plan, uh, certainly we're going to get calls from constituents. We're going to work with our colleagues from the city to make sure we get it right. So um, I just wanted to mention that. And can, can I say something to that? Because it, it's important to say that we invited you all because we wanted you all to hear what, what our concerns were. Even though you're at a state level, we're your constituents, Absolutely. and you all need to know what's happening at the local level. That was very important, so thank you for being here. You know, and I appreciate, we appreciate that too, because we were, you know, in terms of policy, um, and if there's anything that we could do on the state level to help facilitate what needs to be done on the local level, is, is what we're here for. And a lot of times, you know, we encourage our constituents to call us, because sometimes there's council, council gets busy, um, and we help facilitate whatever request is with the corresponding uh, council members. For example, I've got Councilman Gonzalez, I've got Councilman Brockhouse, and I've got Councilman Saldana. So we have, we forge relationships. I know that you've got Councilwoman Sandoval. Sandoval, I've got some of Shirley's and um, some of the So we all try to work together. Now there are times we may not all agree, but we try to work in the best interest of our constituents. <laughs> I just want to thank y'all again. I'm not going to give my name because the only one important person in this room, in this room is G.O.D., so I don't need to tell, <laughs> tell you my name. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank y'all again. But we're, I think sometimes we're missing the point in some of the things that we're dealing with. We do have growth going on in our community already. We have Southwest Research. 
We have NSA, which is National Security Agency. We have probably one of the largest uh, contributors of cyber security, Port San Antonio. And Port San Antonio is going to bring back those jobs that you talked about that our community had so many years ago. We have development that's going on on Acme Road. Leonard is giving Leonard Homes are giving built homes on on Acme Road for under two hundred thousand dollars. You got Habitat that's going on there. Port San Antonio is getting ready to open up probably three hundred seventy four units out there. And the other thing I wanted to share with you that please ensure ensure that you include our children in this development. Somebody I'm said, sorry. You say that ensure, ensure you include our children, 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 okay. children in this development elementary, middle school, and high school, and college story. Because I don't know about you, I don't think anybody in this here room is going to be here 300 years from now. <laughs> we're not going to be here. So many years years <laughs> we're not going to be here. So we need to ensure that we hear from those children to see what's in their minds so they can help and to be involved with what's going to happen in the coming years. And the other thing that's going on in our community is a melting pot also. And uh, you guys talked about Hispanics and, and, and other races and stuff like that, but the main thing that you talked about was Hispanic. But over on Agni Road, we have some, some residents that's coming in from Bahrain. So that's another culture that's coming in our, in, into our neighborhoods. And the other thing is you need to take into consideration, our children will change the dynamics of the census because they're going to create another race. And you guys need to get a hold to that because you don't, you're not going to have any, any say so in, in them develop, developing other races because they're going to join with other races and, and, and have families. So please take that in consideration because those are some major things that we just fail to, fail to forget. And that's what's going to happen in America. And, and, and it's always been happening because America is a melting pot. So you shouldn't be afraid of changing changing the dynamics of your your uh, of your community because it's all about growth we're already dealing with the, uh, the uh, immigration right now so we should be embracing that so i'll go ahead and get off my soapbox but please take that into consideration thank you my name is Hilda Mata, and i went to emma prime i went to elementary i went to escobar junior high I went to Edgar High School, and then I went to Trinity University. And three of those schools are closed. There's no Emma Prime, there's no Escobar, and there's no Edgar. I came back, luckily there's Trinity. <laughs> uh, I came back and I taught in Jose Cárdenas, where, you know, three and four year olds, Spanish bilingual teacher. Those children have diabetes, high blood pressure, they're obese, their ADHD, they got all sorts of health problems, and we're talking three and four year olds. What are we doing for these children? And then we give them cookies, and, and this is our school. We're giving them cookies for snacks and orange juice and uh, you know all just sugary stuff. And then the parents come and pick them up. Where are they going to go play or exercise? There's nothing. I drive to get on the freeway, I'll get on night, go home. And there's nothing. My dad has a house in General Holland, 700 block of General Holland, built it in 56. I come and there's nothing. There's no baseball field no more where I used to play. There's no roller skate. There's nothing for these children. And I think, what is there? Where can these parents take these children without having to drive them far? A lot of them don't have any cars. A lot of them have to walk with their children. This is just an injustice here. We have to worry about these children. Another thing, as adults, we have diabetes, we have high blood pressure, we're wheelchairs. It's hard to get on a wheelchair, but try to cross that street. Or just look up behind you. Try to cross that street on a wheelchair. We need to think of these things. We're not thinking of, we're just thinking about, I don't know what we're thinking about. We're not thinking about this. So I'm looking at the little ones, and then I'm looking, I'm getting older, and so I'm thinking about myself, I'm getting older. We need to think about this stuff. We need to do better. Yeah. That's a dissertation response um, to what you just said, but, but what you just said, Hildra, and all the complexities of public health and how it relates to how wide your street is, 
uh, you know, how much access you have to things like skating rinks or even parks is exactly why SA Tomorrow was brought together. Is that we can't solve these issues simply by looking at zoning designations or by looking at one segment of the city budget. In fact, what you were talking about with regard to schools, the shoe's a little bit on the other foot. We don't have control of our school districts. We support our state leaders, and we're on the same page with regard to school finance and things like that that need to occur. But all of these things are layered together. And while we get caught up in talking about infrastructure and lane striping and, and even PCI scores, the truth of the matter is we don't do any of that just to get the metrics. What we're trying to do is improve the lives of our constituents, making sure that the next generation of children grows up healthier. Um, and has a better opportunity for success and, and being happy, frankly. Go ahead. I'm here in spirit with Collins Gardens Neighborhood Association, and you talk about growth and things like that, and I hear a lot about zoning. I just want to bring something to your attention that happened recently in my, my neighborhood. We had a zoning request for Zosmore and Soralvo, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to put in, in essence, another slaughterhouse. They were going to house live animals there, butcher them, and sell the meat. The problem was that I found out they only send notices to the first 200 feet, but they only send it to the property owners, not the residents in there. And where this would have been was right across the street from some brand new apartments that were built. These people had no idea what might have been coming down the road. And if you've ever tried to break a lease with an apartment, it's very expensive. And I think with something as critical, we managed to get it stopped with help from not only our neighborhood association, Palm Heights, Beacon Hill, everybody got together because when you put a slaughterhouse in, Smell travels. <laughs> if you're aware of the stockyards, you will remember that smell. You cannot get it out of your nose. But I think in the future, instead of just the property owners, they want to notify the residents that live within 200 feet of something like that. Because, yeah, even further, because this has a big impact. And the, the people in the apartments had no idea until we kind of started ruffling feathers and going out there, and then they're like, oh, you know, we didn't know this, but that's something that zoning might need to consider because we don't want to have stuff like that just kind of creep into our neighborhoods with no warning until it's there. So that's just my two cents for that. Thank you for that. And so this has come up a number of times that, um, renters are not notified. And so I know that Councilman and I were fighting very much for more transparency. Um, and the staff response at the time was that they cannot compile information for all of the renters that live there, that it would be very burdensome. And I know that we were really challenging them on that, that, you know, I mean, if you if you have an apartment, can't you distribute a flyer to everybody in the apartment? Uh, and that it would be on the department, the apartment manager to distribute that out. So I know that we've been working on that, and I owe you an update for what the status was, unless you can remember, Councilman, did we, did we finally get the city staff to agree to to do that because it has come up very it's often. A soft -out apartment is what I was told, um, and it seems like they could have put a big sign even at the front notifying the, the the residents that this is happening. So they did have a big sign as well, and I think we changed it. There, there was some legal reason why it, we you know, could not. Had the, the sign for where that was, somebody took it down. So I called zoning and I told. Uh, the caseworker, I said, look, that sign notifying the people of this rezoning has been taken down. Okay. So and we went and put another one back up. I know that's been a big issue, is it notifying the renters? So we'll have to get, unless the council can remember, we definitely have big signs. But it's also why it's so important that we have neighborhood associations. Because I know that then there was some concern that they were going to move that to a neighborhood that didn't have any association. Because then they don't have to, they don't have yeah, to ask yeah. anyone. Yeah, we we're, we updated the signage, and uh, we are also asking to to uh, have a, a much wider mayor distribution. 
But this also points to a, a bigger problem about how we look at our city between home, homeowners and renters. And you have neighborhoods that, that don't have that even of a split. So this, this really brings up such an important issue for, for affordability and <coughs> folks who are going to be represented uh, fully at the city with, with all the tools that we have available because a lot of renters are just simply not represented too well. Can I add something to that? Um, I know that with say tomorrow, when I talked to Chris Ryerson, the Las Palmas area didn't have a neighborhood association to even know what was going on, going on with the SA tomorrow. And how are you going to take care of that? How are those people going to be represented? The other thing with that is, when I spoke to Chris Ryerson, I told him, that's my backyard over there. What happens over there happens over here. So if there's no associations over there, why doesn't he come to other associations to talk to them about it? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, a, a lot of it um, is a requirement uh, that they only have to notify the neighborhood association. Um, and it's only if it's a really complicated project that they, do they go beyond that. And, and those are, you know, ordinances, I think, or laws that are written in that they don't have to notify. But, you know, I think this is also why it's so important that every neighborhood is covered by a neighborhood association. Uh, so that's, um, a, 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 you know, like a flaw that we have to adjust. So that the renters are not being notified, and also that if there's no neighborhood association, then and you're even if you're like one block away, uh, and you're a developer, you don't have to notify. So. And, and we can do a better job with communications. And so we, we've asked our communications department to have um, the ability to, to get out there and communicate more. But ultimately, we ask for your help because, as you pointed out, it's getting the word out, getting your help, and working with you to find out where are those deficiencies and then getting the right person on there. Well, state your name. My name is Mike Foreman. I want to address two issues earlier, Shirley, you said about the growth that I told you I'm also coming out to the suburban area. So I'm saying, why don't we invest more money out there? It seems like all the money is being spent downtown on a lot of development. Uh, if you move a lot of people out of the 1604 area, you can always annex that and bring that in. It seems like it's not convenient for like a VIA or something like that that's pushing more of the downtown stuff to bring people in. And so there's a lot of room out there to people that are coming in, let them move out there. We're here. We've been paying our taxes. We've got the right to be here and have the quality of life that we want and not be crowded by, you know, well, now we're going to have multi family homes here in the big lots. On the west side, we have big lots. The other thing I want to address is uh, you brought it up a little while ago about Phil Hartberger asking for some more money for his part. It's a case of the rich get richer. That park is nice. I've been there. It doesn't need any money. If you can spend some money, you need to spend some money on these parks here first. One of the and the park, and that park, and that park, and the park, spend the money here first. But we don't have some big way to go down and rob you guys for the money. You can go in there. We can't see you. We can't get to you. But somebody like that can. Spend that money here. Let's make these parks look that good. And then, and only then, should Phil Harper get some money for his part. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, and so that's why the equity budget was so important because for the first time since single member districts, districts within our urban core got an additional $70 million additional money. And so uh, we're seeing that with sidewalks, as I mentioned before, uh, finally more funding coming to the areas that need it most because before, two years ago, all the money was being distributed 10 separate ways. So rough proportionality, every district got the same amount of money, regardless of your pavement index, regardless of how many streets you have, regardless of how many libraries, regardless of how many parks, everybody got the same amount of money. And so that's where we're starting to change um, with the new leadership that you have here. The same amount of money for what? For the street development? For, for everything. that didn't happen. Oh yes, it is happening. And in fact, perhaps you walked in a little bit late when I mentioned we have an additional $70 million for our streets uh, in districts 1, 2, 3, 5, and 10. Uh, that's huge. We've never I'm done that. 
Uh, district six, uh, no, 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 the five districts that had less than 70. District six does not have less than 70 PCI score because district six encompasses a lot of 1604 out that way and that area is mostly See, that's new. What, that's what's unfair because it seems like the district six inside New Fortet is never considered. It's considering the major part of district six outside well, I, 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 of Fortet. I, I, in last year's budget, there was over $6 million in the, in the district six budget just for streets in that area. The council member also has to play a role in deciding which streets are paved and which are not based on the priorities of the community. They're, they're, what, what Shirley is saying is that there, there is, it used to be, I'm sorry, Shirley. No, it used to be that we live in a political jurisdictions. There's 10 separate districts here in the city of San Antonio. And so it used to be that you take a, the city budget and everything was divided by 10 so that if you lived in District 9, you get the same amount as you lived in District 2. Problem is, District 2, there has been redlining for generations, and the streets over there are paved on clay. In District 9, they're paved on limestone, so a street on the, on the east side in five years needs another repair, while the street on the north side, on, on District 9, same street, will probably last you 30 years. So if you divide everything by 10, District 2, District 6, uh, in the Edgewood area and several other areas are just going to continue to fall behind. And so what the council did was said, you know what, it might be politically easy to divide everything by 10, but that's not right. It's not right for our community. We have to allocate the resources based on the needs that are there. And that's what we're doing. It, it won't happen in one year that everything gets up to speed, but if we continue to show a little bit of and, you know, intestinal fortitude, and we continue to listen to our community and understand where the priorities are, we can continue to do this. And slowly but surely, everywhere in the city, it should, it won't matter where, what side of town you're on, you will be represented fairly by the services and the infrastructure there. Now, I will tell you, and you're not going to want to hear this, but, you know, folks that live in District 8, 9, and 10, and really throughout the city, love Hardberger Park. And they're going to want some of the, the, money that's available to continue to improve Hartford Park. It shouldn't leave any West Side parks out of out of the the funding. However, consider this. If folks on one side of town were to say, you know what, we want that money over there, and we're able to put it on the ballot and say we don't want you to have any money, you know what kind of chaos that would ensue? It would take us back to the old days before we had single member districts, where it wasn't everyone had a representative in each part of town to represent their interests, it would be wherever the votes are coming from, that's where all the money goes. And is that is that where you want to well, get no, to? I'm okay with the money being distributed first, but I'm saying that these should get the attention first before anything else. Yeah, and wholeheartedly agree with that. And I think we all agree with that. Which is why the proportionate share of the resources for streets and drainage and sidewalks and even parks are beginning to go to the west side, into the east side, into the south side that have been left behind for so long. And it just so happens that you have council members in other parts of town that aren't getting as much, but getting enough, so they agree with that. It's time that in this city, it doesn't matter what zip code you live on, you live in a quality city. And we agree with that. And I will get off my stump. If you want to talk, talk about these charter propositions, I want to talk to you about it because those charter propositions will upend all of this equity that we've been talking about, where everybody lives in a city that is quality. It will take us back 40 years to the days where we didn't have representatives on every side of town fighting for, for, for their constituents. It would take us back to a time where wherever the votes are coming from, that's whoever gets the most money. And that's not fair for anybody, no matter where you are in the, wherever you live in the city. And so I want to talk with you about the charter propositions because it's complicated. And, and I'm going to ask you to vote no on those charter propositions to make sure that we can continue to build a city that's equitable for everyone. So Mayor, the thought there is what uh, Councilwoman uh, Gonzalez said, so everybody's going to get their same share of money every year? Is that what you're no. saying? No. Well, why not? Well, so why, why don't we get a cap on each district and you don't go for that? Uh, we have done it like that since, since for the last how many years our city existed, at least since single member districts, when we did rough proportionality. What we're doing now in our street maintenance program, also in other city departments, including public safety, animal care services, is that the money will go to the areas that need it most. 
And I think that that explains it a little bit versus having to talk about PCI score or, uh, or if it's about the areas that need it most would be addressed. And so uh, hopefully that gets to the gentleman's concern uh, about parks and other services is that the money goes to who needs it most. So that started this year? It started two, last year. well actually last year. Yeah, so last year uh, with Mayor Nehru. Thanks. Uh, my name is Graciela Sanchez. Um, grew up in the West Side and still have a uh, family there. And I'm on the West Side Planning Committee as well as the Midtown Planning Committee. Um, and it's been very frustrating being on those uh, committees because, as people have said, it's not even in English that we're speaking, it's about trying to learn the language of planners and zoning commission and all that sort of stuff. And so, uh, and feeling very frustrated because we're trying to also be creative and we're also trying to talk about keeping people in that those neighborhoods. So yes, maybe people uh, aren't going to the schools anymore, but it's not that the kids aren't in that neighborhood, they might just be going to charter schools or they may be going to magnet schools and so the schools that are there are falling. I mean, again, just like someone else, Reese became Reese Barkley, Cooper closed down, uh, Lanier is destined to possibly close, Scafoya's same thing is being talked about, those schools being closed and here we are planning for the future and we don't even know what's happening. Um, with the schools around us. Um, you know, when you said that, you know, it's been, you know, since the single member districts were created and the proportionality of how the budget was created, I mean, I think it's very frustrating because that was 1976. That was when I was 16, and here I am, 58. And to think that we have had representation where before we didn't have representation and that this is it's taken this long to even consider that the city continues to be ruled by as Maria Antonieta Berriosaba talks about in her book and has told us all the 17 white men doesn't matter who they are they might die but somebody else replaces them and they represent the power of money and making more money and greed at the expense of the poor and marginalized people of this city. And so it's a shame to say that here we have been voting for the last 42 years with representatives that aren't even representing us. And I think that's what, when Amelia talked about respect, because we go before city council, we go to these meetings, we sit on these subcommittees and give hours and hours and hours and hours and we can continue to talk about hours for free. And then when there's a vote because of this new development or that, we're not listened to. They don't pay attention to us. And then people wonder why the folks in districts one through inner city six don't vote. It's because, not because we're apathetic, is because the people aren't paying attention to us. So we say, let's give up. So we're concerned about the land use. We're concerned because, again, density is important, but to think also historically, density doesn't go necessarily up in San Antonio. Density has gone horizontal in little casitas. And how can we look at that when we talk about it and not find ourselves in clashes with the city planners who want, um, who want the West Side to look like Broadway. We don't want the West Side to look like Broadway. Um, and so we want to see if the neighborhoods, the uh, plans of uh, land use will be superseded by the sub-area plans. And I think you said they won't, but I want to make sure that we're okay. taking place. Thank you. <laughs> Association in the West Side Coalition. I, I wanted to ask, I, I know usually um, when I went up here, when I went up there, about the essay tomorrow plan. The plans that are already in place, the neighborhood plans that are already in place, the land use that's already in place, are the comprehensive plan, is it going to supersede what's already in place? And if it's not, 
is there going to be something, a statement or something on a document saying that there is, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to supersede these rights? Because I'm a little bit, I'm still, now I have to say, this is confusing. I did go to your to your um, committee meeting on Thursday that you had for the comprehensive plan for the SA tomorrow. And so I know that you delayed to October the 11th, right? I mean, it's October the 11th. But please understand from us that we, this is, even though it's been a year, it's been hard for us to understand all this. And at that committee meeting, I saw that it was hard for you all to understand it. So how do you think we feel that, you know, uh, we're, we're, we've been in it for a year and we still, you know, uh, have more questions than answers? And when I say that, it's because when we go, when we have, when we're at the meetings and we want to ask questions, they want to right away shut us down. Exactly. Right away. And we ha I have there's committee members here that will attest to that. And so this is why, you know, it, it was important for us to get together for you all to hear from us instead of just the planners, the city planners, directors, and everybody that's involved in that plan, you all needed to hear from the community. And, and we hear you loud and clear. And, and first, I just want to point out that we, we are we are making sure that neighborhood plans are incorporated in all of this. And so, to answer your question, we have, we will get that to you in writing. We'll show you where it's where it's written, and we will continue to, to fight for that because, to your point, you you want to make sure that you're, you're being heard and these plans are truly being considered, and, and you get it right. And I, I, absolutely, we we all want that. Um, and I think and you also touched on the fact that, uh, as you mentioned, that the last committee meeting. There was a lot of questions, and so just know that, that we we are with we're with you on that. And uh, as as we continue to have questions, uh, we want to make sure that you know we're addressing your concerns because we know if we have questions, we're having questions. You got to have a lot more questions, and we're trying to facilitate as many meetings as possible on this. We'll we'll have as many meetings as we must, and uh, as that's why I mentioned again. Please know the AIA is having. Some meetings at, at their facility there on South Florida. Uh, we're we're going to have a few meetings at my field office. I'm sure Councilman Gonzalez is going to have several meetings as well. We'll, we'll continue to do that. Uh, this is this is a complex project uh, process, but we want to make sure that we, we can include everybody and make everybody feel good about uh, being being heard. Thank you. And so I'll just also. Um, comment that in the last meeting, I don't know, some of you all were in the room, was even the first time that I understood it really clearly. And I've been in this for a year and a half, I've been through multiple presentations, I've been briefed multiple times, I finally understood the clarity of all the necessary changes. So we can't expect that people would understand it, you know, just in your regular, given that you have other lives and we're consumed by these things. Uh, but I do hope that that you eventually feel confident that your plans are being accepted, but also knowing that these additional land use, that we discussed land use the last time, gave lots more flexibility for different types of design that we haven't done in San Antonio. So we'll look forward to just more conversations. Thank you. Um, say your name. Hello, my name is Veronica Cardona, and I don't live in the area, but I am a social worker with the company Miners and District 6. And I just wanted to echo what I have been hearing in the room, that there aren't enough city-sponsored programs for the youth in the neighborhood. Coming from the area that I live in, I can ride my bike to a lot of the like, go-kart plays and stuff like that, but here for the marginalized, I've seen how just when a new HEV opens in my area, and God forbid they go and buy milk there, uh, much less go and, and ride go karts where their, their pockets are, are scarred, really. So I just wanted to bring that up. That they're, um, from a social worker's perspective, we, we lack in this side of town uh, for the youth. Um. Okay. Thank you so much. I just want to point out that. In this year's budget, we did get uh, we did fund uh, youth programs for West End Park at the Frank Garrett Center. Uh, it's an area over here on the west side, and Councilman Gonzalez and I share that 
at Park. Um, that is a that is a, a, a big win for for the West End Park and the Frank Garrett Center. Additionally, we're also adding what's called the Youth Free Engagement Center at that at, at uh, Frank Garrett Center. So. Uh, we, we agree with you. We want to try to apply as much um, resources towards our youth, uh, especially where, where it's most needed. And that particular zip code, 7207, is, is, has been identified as, as a zip code that, that needs it the most throughout our city. Some of the programs that I have found uh, in the last year have been at the library, and so I will look at the Garrett Center, but I know for our boys, once you're 18, you don't, you don't qualify. And so I know I speak for a lot of others. There's and so we'll just we we know that we in in the city actually have a really high percentage of now they're calling the opportunity youth. So that means young people 16 to 24 who are not going to school and they're not employed. And so we have to dedicate more money towards that effort. I think in this year's budget it has been proposed three hundred and thirty thousand dollars if I'm not mistaken to um to specifically go after that youth um and get them re-engaged whether it's in school or uh, in, in jobs and workforce so we really need to dedicate a lot of our time with that or opportunity youth um we also have you know in, in this year's bond more money for our memorial and for Las Palmas branch libraries. Um, in District 5, we have four libraries. That's more than any other district with our library. I think you might have more because you have downtown. So um, District 1 may have more. So we have a lot of libraries. We also have a lot of parks. Um, we have 29 parks in District 5. Also, um, after District 1, uh, District 2 actually has 44 parks. But we have a lot of parks. So that's why that equity budget is so significant because we have a lot of parks. We just need to invest in them appropriately. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we're to, just want to say, we're going to do another roughly about five to eight minutes of questions. So we'll be done for the night. Go ahead. Take okay. your name. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kat Valdez. Uh, Mr. Bag, uh, born and raised in the West Side, graduated from Linear High School, have a son that attends there now, a daughter that just graduated last year. Um, I, Mr. Mayor, I want to say first off, thank you very much for um, recognizing that things have not been fair for decades um, and, and creating this equity budget and taking that this approach. I mean, as you've heard all around um, all this evening, we are, yes. Can I just say one thing? Yes. <laughs> On the equity budget, it, it takes a whole lot of teamwork. To yes, do yes, this. yes. It, it takes a whole body to agree on this. At, at many times over the last 40 years, we've had people say, this is not fair, but they've never had a majority say, Time to change. Yeah, and I appreciate that very much. Well, thank you for that. Um, but if you've heard here tonight, you know we are way far behind on the west side. Everything from our streets, our sidewalks, our drainage, our schools losing um, students, everything, the, the investment in the neighborhoods um, that uh, Councilwoman Gonzalez talked about, that, that investment in the neighborhoods is not there. That's why we're losing students. That's why people grow up here and move away. Um, and don't return. They go to school or go do whatever and, and they don't return. People live here, they have to go somewhere else to work, they have to go somewhere for entertainment, they go spend their dollars somewhere else. We're very, very, very far behind. And so I think that while it's really important, I, I want to kind of bring that into, we're behind on healthcare, we're behind on everything. Um, so it's going to take a lot of, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. But one of the things that we've talked about here is that involving the neighborhoods and involving the neighborhood associations. I want to, you know, we only have, I think you mentioned we have 11 here on the west side or in District 5. We can't rely on just the formation of neighborhood associations to let people know about the things that are going on. We've had so many things creep into the west side that really just kind of caught a lot of people by surprise. Neighborhood associations are based on volunteers. You guys are our elected officials. You are the ones that are paid just to be there, to be our eyes and ears, to understand everything that's going on in your district. And so I'm asking you to do more to communicate better, more effectively. You know, the fact that uh, there was going to be a slaughterhouse, another slaughterhouse on the west side that was, that was being looked at and people didn't know. We have a high percentage of renters in the west side because a lot of people can't afford to be homeowners. 
bonds. And so, yeah, bail, yeah, bail bonds. Um, every, everything that's undesirable has historically been dumped in the West Side. The jail, the bail bonds, the, the homeless shelter, the mental health service, everything that has been undesirable for decades this has been happening. And a lot of it has been happening, with, again, without really the people being involved. And like Graciela said, why? Because people don't vote. And people don't vote because they're discouraged, because they believe that people don't care about the West Side. So I, I think the point being is we need you guys to be extremely active and proactive in making sure that when you hear something, because you are the first ones to get notified, or should be the first ones to get notified of your staffs, that you are making sure that you're communicating back to the community and allowing the community to be proactive before it's already a done deal. So again, thank you for what you're doing, and um, you know, I ask you How many times a dollar is recycled in ECL with this? Yes. Okay, so this is, this is the dollar. But we want to, I want to just know if y'all have a knowledge on if a, if a dollar is spent in, in this district, if the dollar is spent in this district, how many times is it recycled before it goes out? And then, the other, of course, I have was just on ATB. When you all going to do something on, on, about giving giving our ATB some co competitive some competition to re redo that ATB in Los Palmas? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I'll tell you a couple of stats that we know because now we have all kinds of data. And so one thing that we do know that um, we actually have a higher percentage of home ownership than any other place in the city here in District Five. Fifty-seven percent of our residents are homeowners. We know that uh, in District 5, most of our housing stock was built before 1970. So that means we have old houses, right? We, and somebody said earlier, we, we don't have any new uh, developments in the neighborhood. We also know that fewer people come to District 5 to work than any other place in the city, right? So we have no big employers. That's another thing that's we, data that we know. Uh, but we also know that as we're doing our essay tomorrow plan, one thing that has come to light is that we, what we really want is for people to live, work, and play in their neighborhood. But in District 5, we have no jobs. So most people go out to work, and hardly anybody comes in to work. Um, but we have the same percentage of people who live, work, and play in their neighborhood than any other place in the city. So it, it's kind of just, so we have about 10% of our population live, work, and play in the district. Nobody, hardly anybody comes here to work. Um, and those are just some, just interesting data. So what we need, what I have always advocated for is more investment in small businesses because we know that we're not gonna get a big employer. Um, some of the things you mentioned are a little bit outside my district so I'm not as intimately familiar with what's happening at past okay. west of, of, of um, Acme. Okay, but we don't, we don't have any large employers and we also don't have any large retailers, so we don't have a single big box retailer in District 5. That means no Walmarts, no Targets, no uh, big, nothing. We only have small businesses. And so I have always believed that we have to capitalize on our strengths. We don't need to recruit uh, those kind of businesses here. Anyway, we don't have room. Uh, all we can do is sort of build organically and build with our strengths, and that means doing the best we can to support small business. So I guess you basically really answered it. Probably our dollars recycled once before it goes out. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let me, let me just add to that because uh, I think she brings up some, some, some incredible points here. Uh, with, with that high home ownership, that, that really puts uh, a high priority on saving the existing housing stock. And, and just know something, another piece of data that, 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 that we collected that's out there. I sent out the Veracruz Board of Directors and we did a map to take a look at what are, what are some of the areas where we're seeing the, the highest prices of land values going up. And we also, when we did that map, we learned that we found the areas that are dropping significantly and it's the west side. And so to that point, if you have that high of ownership, uh, it's important to, to, to let people know that this is housing stock that we need to protect. This is These are homeowners. We need to allow um, every opportunity to age in place. And we've got programs to do that. So so take advantage of that. This year, $4.25 million going citywide 
for roofs. And I can see a lot of roofs going into those neighborhoods to help protect that housing stock. A lot of money into the minor home repair as well. This is an important part of our city. It, 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 I think that, that to, to her point, we want to bring more businesses, but let's protect that housing stock. That is, that is an important uh, uh, point and, and percentage that, that I think is, is uh, vital to, to the history, the culture of the West Side. I wanted to make one statement. I know that Graciela and other people have brought this up. One thing that people forget, a lot of the area in the west side, we have a lot of elderly. A lot of the people do not have internet. They do not have smartphones. So a lot of information is good, but how do we get it to them? I mean, they, they don't have, I mean, when you don't have access to it, you don't have it, how is it getting out to the people? Because it's not. I have one more question for the mayor. I'm going to try to answer that. Part of it is, is that we, we, we did start, uh, of course it was not very popular, it got stopped, uh, but there was those Google Huts, and we did successfully get one installed at West End Park, which allows for, for uh, affordable uh, internet in that area because because of the way it's structured and the way uh, Google was was putting putting the system out. AT and T's also uh, got a lot of fiber going out into many parts of our neighborhoods, but we got to keep pushing. And there's a lot of partnerships that allow us uh, to help connect uh, low income areas for with for for uh, internet services and and provide some connectivity. But on top of that, are they going to actually use it? Right. So I would say. We need to get. We need to find the best tools available. We're, we're working with. I, I know to uh, working with the communications department to provide more mailers to provide information the old-fashioned way. I mean, it still works, but uh, we need to get that out there. We hope to see a lot more information going in the back of CPS bills or sauce bills to help inform people. Everybody gets those, so it would be a great way to, to get that information out. So, and I'll just, I'll just add, um, so we know, uh, again, that we have these petitions that are coming that are very bad for our city, three fire party position, petitions um, regarding the city manager's pay, her tenure, arbitration, and uh, the, lowering the, tr the threshold to get an ordinance um, uh, on the ballot. These are all really important because, you know, as it was said, we vote in lower numbers, and we know that the only way that we really communicate with our constituents in, in these districts on the west side is one-on-one, -on -one. and that makes it so much harder for us as electeds to get our, um, our information out. And so while um, in internet, I mean, of course, we have the digital divide, and that's an issue that has um, plagued us for a long time, that we don't have sufficient uh, and affordable uh, access to the internet. But it also makes it uh, makes our jobs very hard because we have to spend our time going one-to-one, -one, going to our neighborhood associations, going to our churches, even though the Catholic Church doesn't want to get involved, but I talked to Father Mike and he, he has told me he would, he would at least let us talk to the other priests. Um, because we have to do it uh, the old-fashioned way and there's no way around it. There's no shortcut. I wish we could say that um, you know, we'll send a blast. Uh, but as we're discussing these petitions and we're, we're discussing the things that you all care about, we just know that, that we have to do it the old-fashioned way. My name is Juan Valdez. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, uh, the 20 people in the back, they give them their title. No. <laughs> 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 okay. I'm from the My neighborhood association uh, is on this uh, land use map. And what concerned me is that the map that was given to me was a large R6 area, which is uh, schools. And as we all know, the school can be anything, R6 or whatever. You can build a school. There's a lot of empty land. But there's also some apartments that are there, the Edgewood apartments. So it never dawned on me. I saw uh, number 12 pass by twice. I had forgotten that we had a case there. We were right across the street, number 15. One comes in, one of the apartment units is on fire. Um, we took off, and I from here to the sign. Fortunately, there was people like guiding us, go this way, go that one, whatever. So we get to the building, we take the story. It was a 
right? Three man crew. So you have an engineer to fix your truck, get the water. You have your finish in order to like is anybody a help us on the bill or whatever. In the meantime I'm checking the bill uh, the second floor of the text in my park. The manager by chance, thank God she was there, she opened the door, quick picture. Go to the fire room, the room that was the fire room bedroom. Do a quick check for anybody that's there. Close that door. Go to the other room. Do a quick check for any kids who are getting in closets and stuff under the beds. Anywhere. Okay. So I'm doing all this. Can I imagine? The clock's ticking. So they go to the door. By this time, my lieutenant has a, a hose up the ladder coming up the, the stairs. I go in, brace myself, open the room. I was fully involved and blast it with the water. Okay. So you wait, and you can hear your buddies coming way the hell up. 26, 6, 27, number 8, 33. You can hear the sirens. If you're there at that moment, on your own, right across the street. Now all around my front compass, you want to make it higher than this. Now it's not just fire, it's also medical. So the concern I have is that we still have the same number of fire, fire stations. And no, in our the responding units, we're still saying you have more units, but still, um, it takes time. Why? I got a kid from a lady down about four houses from mine. The house behind the top five. I was going to go check the house. My chest, I took the dog out to the bar, and I didn't want to come out. And I thought it was a new lighting. And I said, oh, shoot. I mean, I don't think. The city burns wood or anything. Yep, sure enough. So I go to that thing, and uh, what the lady's backyard had two uh, like garage units or whatever. So they're able to hold, right? Oh, gumbo, trying to help out. Oh, great question. But anyhow, you forget what you're actually doing. It's like, it's like normal. But the problem is that they very, I mean, you're, never, I mean, you're just doing it because you do it. But my concern is, is we have more growth. We gotta be careful that it's all in unison. We said we have an equity budget. We need another budget. A budget that transfers or transverses boundaries. Remember that thing that collapsed, the sewer line collapse? I went to the sewer cells and saw that sewer line system. I'm not a fan. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my humans are up. Oh, I mean, no, I just did. But, um, but please, emergency service response time is very important. If we keep bringing in higher density, HUD is going to enhance higher density. So they went to single family homes. So if HUD's doing it, when they built the uh, Henry Gonzalez uh, apartments of Zamora, the ones next to it, please be careful. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh that was a neighborhood president. That wasn't uh, West Side. <laughs> okay, uh, we have one more, and that's it. I think Wendy, it's okay. Hey, I just want to make this quick statement. Um, first of all, thank you for being here tonight. And um, I just want to say that the Hispanic community has been a very suppressed community for generations. And that sometimes has been, I remember my mother telling me, and I was saying in Spanish and then in English, no digas nada, vete para allá. Don't say anything, go over there and be quiet. That will not happen anymore for any generation. We care, we love, we love our family, we want our, we want future for our kids. We want great things for our community. We have a lot of concerns. Please hear our cry. That's all I have to say. We're an invitation out to all the council people. We're 11 association proud, right? Can we have tours for y'all for each of our uh, associations? We have 11, it's not 80, it's 11. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it. We, we, each of us can show them what we're talking about, right? So that's an invitation, a challenge maybe, but we'd like you to be a part of it. Yes. <laughs> 11 is Okay, so yeah, thank you very much for being here tonight. So um, the coalition has a couple of things to work on here. Y'all more welcome to stay for a little bit after that. It takes a little bit. Shouldn't take very long. Um, we are on new business. 
We really don't have to do business with it. Um, I'm going to ask John up here. John, come on up and you've got some announcements for our next meeting. Um, just real quickly, our officials, the Westside Coalition of Presidents meets a third Monday of every month. Just one more item that I wanted to make sure that gets addressed. Uh, excuse me. Just one more item that I want to make sure it gets addressed. Um, I went to a workshop for uh, property taxes. When you want to fight your property taxes. And so one of the things that stayed with me there was that they were saying that it's very important for us to go to a meeting when they're going to set the property tax rates. And this meeting is going to take place on August the 29th. They say that these meetings are, are maybe one, two, three, four, five people maybe go. And it's very important that we show up at these meetings because this is where it counts when it comes to property taxes or things like that. So anyways, I just want to make sure that I mention that. August the 29th, I see it on the uh, channel 16 for city council when the meetings come out and all the information, it's posted on there. Thank you. All right, once again, thank you to our officials. Uh, everybody, make sure you say thank you to Justin for all the pizza that he bought tonight. Thanks for coming out. And we'd also like to thank the folks that are with Nowcast for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you. Again, thanks for coming out, everybody.